Harley Quinn Breaking Glass is a YA comic about the life of a 15-year-old Harley Quinn that just moved into Gotham. And it sucks. Illustrated by the very talented Steve Pugh, and written by the not-so-talented Mariko Tamaki, I have been heavily recommended to analyze this comic, after my most recent major review series on I Am Not Starfire. If you haven't seen it, you may want to watch that now for context into my knowledge on this writer. Mariko Tamaki's most recent source of grand infamy was the very blatant self-insert fantasy disguised as a superhero comic that is I Am Not Starfire. After thoroughly analyzing that, my fans guided me to this comic for having many of the same issues. And after reading the book through in its entirety, my conclusion is, yes. It has almost all of the same issues. This comic is a mess of obnoxious wokeness disguised as an actual comic. This work isn't nearly as bad as I Am Not Starfire, but it is still a massive, awful mess for nearly all the same reasons as I Am Not Starfire. And what's really sad about this piece of trash is that this comic is worse than a grand disaster. It's boring and forgettable. Now, look, I don't wish all things are bad so I can laugh at them. I'm not an edgelord. I'm saying that when it comes to a bad piece of work, the only real thing a viewer can gain from it, outside of knowledge on what not to do as a creator, is just some cheap laughs. I Am Not Starfire has a lot of that, but this comic? This comic is just flat and nothing, dude. It's drawn really well, courtesy of Steve Pugh's artistic abilities, but when it's also written by a woman that only has the ability to make one type of story, a self-indulgent, politic-infested mess of a brain-dead fantasy, the pair make for a combination of aggressive mediocrity. For everyone who's watching this video without knowledge into who Mariko Tamaki is, allow me to give you guys a quick sit rep. Mariko Tamaki is a supposed veteran writer for DCYA Comics, creating many award-winning graphic novels. These novels in question, however, are all horrible and primarily consist of 90% lazily written self-insert power fantasy fictions that are more focused on discussing and propagandizing Mariko's personal, political, and societal beliefs as opposed to actually making a story. To keep it as simple as possible, she is the result of what happens when one of those obnoxious Twitter feminists from 2015 became a book writer, and it shows in every single thing she has created. If you need more knowledge into how much of a talentless hack this person is, please, please, please watch the I Am Not Starfire review series that I made on my channel. I hate to put you guys through watching a seven video series in order to understand, but but there's only so much else I can do for you if you want an elaborate case of information right now. Anyway, let's discuss this comic. You know how Harley Quinn is a badass psychopath that can go from villain to hero to whatever's in between? You know how she's one of DC's mainstay characters simply because of her three-dimensional personality and backstory? You know how she's done all types of crazy things in movies, comics, and TV shows that make her really interesting? Yeah, well, uh, how does Mariko Tamaki handle her? Oh, simple! She turns her into a boring-ass 15-year-old high school girl that has to stop her neighborhood from getting gentrified by the evil corporate white male businessmen. Because, you know, that's one of Gotham City's biggest issues. Gentrification. Man, it's almost as if Mariko is just using this story frame as an excuse to complain about things that she does not like on a personal level outside of this comic. But nah, it's not like she would ever do that. It's not like she's done that before, or anything like that. She's never done that before. Alright, let's begin the comic. Now, look, thanks to the fact that this author, Tamaki, has all the same issues in all of her pieces of work, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. But I will try to do my best to cover as much of the comic as I can without getting redundant. No promises, here we go. Let's see how much I can tolerate it. The story opens up with, of course, Harley Quinn narrating the plot as you read. The scenario begins with her moving into Gotham City as opposed to her living there from day one. This plot thread is important so she can not know anything and ask questions more for the sake of plot. Throughout the comic, Miss Quinzel is narrating the entire story, and Tomiki's writing skills are on full display here. It's bad. She's trying her best to mimic Harley's dialect, but it's 
really embarrassing and cringeworthy to read because she's trying way too hard to act as her. Maybe it could have been a little bit more tolerable if she wasn't speaking and narrating so often because it would be slightly less noticeable, but yeah, that's not what's happening here. Throughout the comic where Harley is slowly moving in and stuff, the dialogue will not stop even though there's no reason for it to be there, and it's wincing to look at. On page 11, this narration occurs. In Little Red Riding Hood, the grandma gets eaten. Spoiler alert, which is kinda gross, especially if you like grandmother. Harleen always thought it was a bummer that a lumberjack had to save Little Red Riding Hood. Harleen would've just punched the wolf in the face! LOL, look at me, I'm so quirky, guys, pay attention to me! <sighs> Look, you see what I'm talking about here? Tomaki's trying way too hard to write all scatterbrained and zoomer level random and quirky with this. So it really gives off the vibe of, oh, hello, fellow kids, look at me, uh, fidget spinners and TikTok and Fortnite emotes, look at me, guys. You like me now, right? I relate now. Also, let's get this out of the way right now. The art style. It's good. It's really, 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 really good. This artwork is created by the absolutely skilled and talented Steve Pugh. I never did like Americanized comic art styles, but this guy is a masterclass when it comes to creating it. He actually has his own website and Twitter page, stevepugh.com, so if you like what you see on screen, you can find him on that website. But regardless of how well this stuff is drawn, it does not change the issue here. When you're making a comic, the story and writing always go first. And the story and writing, well, it's terrible. It doesn't matter how well the work is drawn if the context is regarding the most cringe-inducing nonsense imaginable. And trust me, you're about to see what I'm talking about soon. Quinzel crashes at her new place after meeting her sudden foster father, who by the way I'd like to inform you, has decided to specifically announce the fact that he is gay. I think. Honestly, I cannot tell, and I don't think you will be able to either after I show you this dialogue. You tell me what this means. Okay, so uh, the Harley's like asking this dude to stick around in the house and stuff, and he's like, Aw, oh, gee, cat whiskers, miss ma'am. Can I stay, please, please? I'll get a job. Anything? Aw, oh, please. Please, 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 with a bucket of Cocoa Puffs. You see how freaking obnoxious this dialogue is? Like, it's not even like, oh, because it's Harley Quinn. This is just cringe-inducing, dude. But yeah. Please, 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 with a bucket of Cocoa Puffs on top. And then this guy, I think, says, First, I'm mama to my friends. But a proud gay man, so mama will do fine. What? I... Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say the thing that I always say. Here it is. There's a lot to unpack here. First of all, is this motherfucker a guy or a girl? In the previous page, it's established that this dude's name is Benny, but then Harley calls the motherfucker Miss Benny. I want to jump to the assumption that Harleen is just like you know, being kooky or whatever, but for all I know, this could be some forced transgender representation because you know how western comics are and you know how the author is. And second of all, what is this guy trying to say? My guess is that this is a typo and he's trying to say I am a proud gay man so mama will do fine. But this also leads me to, third of all, even within the context of my correction to this assumed typo, this response is still a solid mess. Why do you feel the need to suddenly inform a random ass child that just entered your home that you like dudes? And fourthly, and finally, boys. I want you all to stop for a moment and take into consideration that someone was paid to write this. This is page 14, people. Page 14. That's how long it took for this author, Tomaki, to make a glaring error in the one thing she supposedly is a two-time award winner at. Let that sink in. If that's not a first impression of the levels of quality in this comic, I don't know what is. Alright, let's continue. So yeah, she crashed at the place where this uh, gay dude lives at, I guess, and goes to sleep. To which afterwards we run into yet another prime mainstay of Mariko Tamaki's awful writing. Disjointed flashbacks that don't affect the narrative or anyone's backstory in any way. Yeah, Harleen goes to sleep and then we get introduced to a random flashback to when she was 11 and her parents' car got stolen. 
Harleen tries to help get it back, but she is a goddamn child, so she fails. That's all that happens in that flashback. Nothing else of interest or anything that improves the character at all. The flashback also only lasts two pages, so maybe we should have not had this moment at all on the grounds that it literally doesn't matter? Like, there's a lot of moments in I Am Not Starfire that have the exact same issue. You just sit there and you look and wonder, why am I witnessing this? What does this have to do with anything? Quinzel wakes up from her disjointed flashback and heads off to her school that she somehow knows that she needs to go to. The school in question is Gotham High. And throughout her trip to Gotham High, Harley will not shut her goddamn mouth, constantly saying quirky stuff simply for the sake of being quirky. I swear to god, Mariko Tamaki writes characters that talk too much to compensate for the fact that she's just talking out of her ass at all times. During her run through, she bumps into this black chick helping up a super stereotypical nerd character. Uh, the comics words, not mine. You're probably wondering, who is this black chick? Oh, that's Poison Ivy, of course! Who else would it be? Yep, that's right. They race washed her. Alright, so we got grown men awkwardly announcing the fact that they're gay out of nowhere in obnoxiously mangled sentences that make no sense. And we got a DC mainstay character whose race has been changed for basically, literally, no reason. I'm not gonna go further into that just yet. First, I wanna show you that it gets worse with this girl. Way, way worse. I'm gonna explain panel by panel what happens right at the start to chapter two. I, I wanna repeat that. This is, this is the beginning of chapter two. I wanna make that really clear. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> All right, so it's Harley and Ivy who's like just chilling in school, walking around. And the first thing, the first piece of dialogue is Ivy saying, I'm not saying wrong. Uh, what? I, I guess this is in the middle of a conversation for context. I'm saying there's a state of inequality. The world is an unfair place all the time. And Harley is just being Harleen. And uh, yeah, Ivy's like, Ivy looks at a film club paper, a film club poster on the wall or something, and it's like, This is film club, right? School club. And yet, this club has never played a movie directed by a woman, let alone a woman of color. And then uh, in the next panel, this dude, I think it's a dude, the, mo the motherfucker looks like Ellen DeGeneres, but anyway, n the guy says the name of film directed by a female that is worthy of discussion. And, uh, yeah, uh, she names a bunch, and, uh, I guess, it, I guess, um, I guess he ignored it, and he's like, oh, don't bring your tired diversity agenda into my arena. It's pointless. And then after that, like, two panels later, Ivy gets triggered like one of those weirdo freak feminists and shit, and is like, screw you! Just because your parents own Gotham doesn't mean you get to use your patriarchal substandards to define art! Dick, and and she just goes on and on and on. I uh, <laughs> I do want to say something that's really funny. If you look at this panel, you see you see Harley Quinn's just sitting in the background, like yeah, I guess I'm I guess I'm involved in this. Yeah, all right. yeah, I guess I guess I have something to do with this comic. Yeah, I guess I'm relevant somehow. But <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, she goes on too. That like in a couple of like in the next panel, she's still ranting. The history of women in the world of the arts is a history of exclusion, and we're not gonna take it anymore. We're not gonna take it. Okay, I'm just gonna stop there. I think you guys get the point. So, yeah. Surprise! Ivy is no longer a three-dimensional eco-terrorist who only cares about the green and sees no value in human life due to the constant ideological conflicts of humanity. Now, she's a boring, annoying, butthurt, vegan activist who runs around crying about gender inequalities. Conveniently, the exact same type of gender inequalities that Mariko Tamaki would go out of her way to complain about in real life. Man, I'm sure that's just a total, total coincidence. I've been doing some, like, brainstorming, and I think I have a theory about Poison Ivy's character specifically. Okay, so way, way far back in the past of what 
Ivy's character originally was. She was originally a super stereotypical, like, enticing, like, temptress type character who would use her traditional feminine beauty and plant-based neurotoxins to hypnotize and enthrall victims to do her dirty work and learn classified knowledge from hypnotized people and all that stuff, right? And Mariko Tamaki seems to really not like women who have a traditional form of femininity. Or femininity. Fem uh, whatever. So my theory is that she got butthurt because her abilities stem off of the stereotypes of a seductress type character because she's a woke feminist who hates anything outside of her political spectrum. So out of sheer bitterness, she twisted Ivy into this butthurt activist that says everything she would say and thinks everything that she would think. But again, that's just my theory. I could totally be wrong, but hey, I'm pretty confident. You guys tell me what you think in the comment section. As for the race change though, I have no idea. It literally affects nothing. I can't think of any reason to change her from ginger to light skin black outside of just doing it for diversity points. Guys, I want to apologize. I'm not trying to make this review a, a, a weird complaint towards weirdo feminists on Twitter, but that archetype of person has polluted this work with lazy, lazy ass writing. Like, that's just the way the story is going. There's basically no plot yet. It's just establishing the butchering of our favorite characters and shoving politics down our throat. So now that that's all been established, what is the story? People, what happens next is not just bad writing. It's not just a, a poorly written story, but it's also going to display how little the author of this comic cares about making a DC story and is more concerned over just talking about random stuff that she doesn't like. Have you noticed we're two chapters in and nothing feels like a DC comic? Nothing feels Batman related? Nothing feels Gotham City related? You want to know why? Because the author doesn't care. And I'm going to show you in a second. In the middle of chapter two, a hefty handful of things get established. The neighborhood that Quinzel just got introduced to is suddenly in danger. The evil corporate rich white males are taking over the poor neighborhood via gentrification. Oh no, everyone knows that that's Gotham City's biggest problems. Not criminals destroying the city, bank robbers, people that want to take over the world. No, none of that shit. Corporate manipulation. That was the real issue in Gotham. So yeah, the neighborhood is in danger. Danger, but that's okay because Harley Quinn is a badass. And what does the Harleen we all know and love do in response to this? Well, she becomes a protester with butthurt SJW Ivy. And I quote in a specific piece of dialogue from this book, any poodle, Ivy said it was time to get feminist. It was time to get feminist. An actual human being wrote this. They both become school protesters that conveniently are dressed like clowns. Why? It's simple. The reason why is totally, totally, totally simple. And not a really, really, really stupid excuse to barely piece Quinzel's lore together. The reason why is because, according to this dialogue, there was this one group of protesters called the, the Gorilla Girls? All the members wear gorilla masks and they raise awareness of how, how, about how few women artists get to be in museums and have their work valued in, in the patriarchy. So that's why they're clowns. Because it's a tribute. See guys, it makes perfect sense. It definitely, it, uh, oh my God. Okay, you know what? No, I can't even be sarcastic about this. Boys. The author does not care. Mariko Tamaki does not care. She is not interested in writing a story featuring a beloved DC superhero. She's just here to talk about whatever random shit she does and does not like. We are almost 50 pages into this. That's 25% of the whole comic. And everything you love about Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy and Gotham City has all been twisted around so the author can just rant about something she doesn't like. This comic has a 4 out of 5 on various review sites, by the way. The way Tomaki writes shit is so disconnected from the superhero genre. 
Like, no, it's not even that. It, it's disconnected from literally anything that she does not care about. That's why everything is so lazily written and hard to really analyze until any of the woke bullcrap comes in. Because it's that stuff that is super over-described and discussed. And everything outside of it is just an afterthought. It's a hollow shell. So yeah. After reading two and a half chapters, it's already confirmed. Tomaki is just going through the motions, not giving a damn about making an actual story. You know, just like all of her other works. Her comics are like Doritos flavors. It, it's all the same sh with slightly different flavors and packaging. That's her work in a nutshell. Once again, Tomaki bundles up all of her butthurt bottled up emotions towards aspects of society that she doesn't approve of and projects and spills it all out within this landfill of a DC story. And just like I Am Not Starfire, the blatant disconnect between DC's lore and Mariko just shoving her own personal issues into the comic are clear as day. So, now that we've established that this comic right from the very first two chapters is a joke by default, I've said everything that I need to say about this waste of trees. But still, there's something left over that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about in a separate video. Let's wrap this up in part two. See you there, boys. And let's not forget that I'd really appreciate it if you pass me some cash on Patreon. My $10 supporters are... Stormy Knight, Duke Dragon Hearthfire the 10th, Elamations, Joseph Vincent, Procrastinator Dave, Red Pixel Racer, and Sindrin7. And let's not forget our $5 supporters, Zephyr Zodiac, Aeon, Dragonlight Z, Elijah Holland, Phydra, Travis, Wolfman, and Yumi with a Gun. If you'd like to support me as well, just catch me on patreon.com slash blacklightjack. Thanks for watching, everybody.